I'm Guido Gerlitz, the interim instructor of the Glass Three course here at CCA. Uh, it's my pleasure to be introducing to you this evening one of the more innovative and dynamic contemporary designers I've had the privilege of working with in my 22-year career in glass. Nicholas Weinstein was born in New York City in 1968. His aesthetic derives from a long-standing interest in the natural world established during his internships at the American Museum of Natural History and the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. His first formal experience in working with the medium of glass was through a program at the Rhode Island School of Design. This is where Nicholas became fascinated by this unique material and its ability to transform from a formless liquid into a solidified, fixed, and sometimes complex shape. After graduating from Brown University with a degree in literature, Nicholas moved to San Francisco and started work for a graphic designer, Michael Crowen. Cronin, excuse me. Blowing glass on the weekends, he eventually left and started Nicholas Weinstein Studios here in San Francisco in 1991. Without extensive formal training and largely self-taught, his interest in organic forms were unrestrained by more traditional techniques in glass, which resulted in his unique approach to the manipulation of the material. Through his exploration of visual texture by the use of plaster and cast iron molds, his first expressions were smaller glass sculptures sold in design boutiques and galleries. When Frank O'Gary approached Nicholas to design and build an installation for the central atrium of DZ Bank's new headquarters in Berlin, his largest commission to that date had not exceeded seven feet in length. This project, when completed, covered 2,000 square feet and weighed more than two and a half tons. This was the launch of Nicholas's continuing interest in the works that lie in the intersection of art and architecture and which leverage new technologies to build living works in glass. His concept of creating something large enough to have a conversation with the architecture resonates through all his contemporary installations. He continues to work with some of the most innovative and renowned architects in the world, creating pieces that range from the intimate in scale to those that define and char the character of an entire space. In all of his works, the beauty and message of the completed piece fail to justify the complexity involved with its creation. Each piece, seemingly simple in its elegance, holds unique solutions to numerous mechanical and physical challenges. Each piece manipulates this age-old material to create site-specific works that are original with an appearance unlike any other. So without further ado, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you my friend and one of my favorite designers, Nicholas Weinstein. Uh, thanks, I guess there's really nothing much to add, so I'll be leaving. Um, Excellent uh, summary, Guido. I'll, uh, I'll just skip whole section. Um, so uh, I thought I'd start by um, uh, just talking about how I approach the work. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been at a dinner party uh, or out for drinks and someone asks what you do, and I, I've always found that it's a pretty good litmus test if you're uh, eager slash willing to tell them. Uh, if you are, that means you're probably proud of what you do. Um, I think that's pretty important, and if you're not, you should probably change what you're doing. Um, that having been said, uh, I don't always like going to work. People have this uh, notion of creatives as consumed by their art, and uh, I have to say that oftentimes I find the design process really difficult. Um, I dread it. Um, but the thing that keeps me coming back to it is that uh, I think glass is a pretty remarkable material for three particular reasons. Um, the first being that it's extraordinarily technically challenging. Um, I learned this very early on. Uh, unless you really do it for about 10 or 20 years straight, you're not going to be very good at it. Um, it's kind of like learning to play the piano. Um, the second thing is that it's fundamentally about light. Uh, 
a cheap parlor trick, but uh, very effective. This is why they use it for fiber optics. Uh, I'm just wiggling my fingers. And because light has such a dramatic effect on the glass, the pieces that you make with it are always changing. And that's a very compelling idea that the sculptures you make out of this material aren't fixed. Um, the last thing is that, uh, as Guido mentioned, it's uh, magically elastic. Um, it can pretty much take any shape. You can smush it, stretch it, pull it, twist it, bend it, um, and really create uh, an infinite number of forms. So uh, I'm going to talk to you sort of in five sections tonight. The first is the Cosmopolitan Crash Course, which is taking one project, the Cosmopolitan Tower, and sort of walking you through a couple of things that uh, we encounter to give you an idea of uh, what the work looks like and what kind of problems it aggregates. Uh, the second is uh, has roughly been covered by Guido, but perhaps not the imposter part. Um, so I'm going to tell you how I ended up doing what I do. Um, the third is uh, entitled, Where Do You Find These People? This is a common question when uh, I work overseas. Uh, I'd say that about 99.9% .9 of our work is not in this country. We don't have any work here except for one of significance. And people always sort of look at us after we've finished presenting the work and go, who? Who builds this stuff? So I'll uh, talk a little bit about that because that's pretty important. Uh, the fourth thing I was going to talk about is fabric. Uh, I've been spending a lot of the time uh, uh, over the last three or four years sort of trying to build, for lack of a better word, glass textile systems. Um, so I thought I'd talk about that across four or five projects so you can kind of get inside my head and watch me think about one thing through a whole bunch of different uh, situations. Um, and then the last thing uh, is this idea that Guido mentioned of talking to building. Um, and that's a sort of general, what, what do we do when we start these projects and um, what's important to us? So uh, the Cosmo Crash Course. Uh, so this is um, in Singapore. It's an external installation. It's the only one that we've done outside. Um, and it's at the end of an approach to a pair of residential towers at the left and right. Um, and the whole site is defined by these, uh, by this sort of language of columns, right? You've got these uh, wooden columns in the front there, and then actually at the rear of that image, uh, hard right, you'll see these giant pylons, um, which are these large creatures in the middle uh, that you see here. And those are actually what the buildings sit on. About, they start about six stories up. So the whole site. Um, has this kind of language and we figured that's what we'd play with. Obviously these things are pretty large. They're about uh, six meters tall, so about 20 feet tall. They're big around, pretty much just like trees. Um, so the trick on this project um, was the tension between all the straight lines in the architecture and then these very, very simple, pure curves. And um, because they're, you know, they're, they're pretty much the length of this stage, um, to make a mold that smooth is really hard, especially that big. And because it's just one curve and one curve only, any perturbations, any variances are immediately visible in the finished piece. Um, just because the idea is simple, you can, you can pick up where it failed, essentially. So um, our first attempts, um, not the bridge, uh, our first attempts to build this uh, kind of worked. Um, we got a bunch of faceting as I was just saying, might be a problem. And um, we also didn't have a kiln much bigger than a truck. Um, so we couldn't really see how it was going to work. And driving over the bridge one day, um, I selected this one because it's a little easier to see very clearly here. Um, I remarked on the beautiful catenary curves of the primary cables that you see that droop uh, between the two stanchions. And that's a, that's a basic. Uh, physical law that if you uh, take two points that aren't in the same vertical plane, gravity will describe a perfect arc between them. Um, and we figured that that, or at least I did when I was driving alone and then convinced my shop, uh, that that was the way to actually make these things. So <laughs> as with many projects, we built a kiln to do this. Um, we've done two sort of large kilns for particular projects, and um, this one which you can see Dave christening at the right uh, at its first launch. Oh, can you hear me okay if I wasn't talking into this? Fine. Um, 
So that yeah, and this is it uh, arriving at the shop. But uh, just to give you an idea of how it actually works, um, the whole thing's on giant legs, so it's it's essentially a hat kiln. That's the description for that. Uh, and there's a large sort of railroad bed that rolls in underneath, and then there's a winch system that lifts it up and into place. And on the inside, <clears throat> I think, I can't really remember, but I think after we made a lot of mistakes, we came up with this, um, which is an assembly that, that has this sort of sling, kind of like a dolphin carrier. I don't know if you've ever seen those. Um, and you basically, we'd stack up all these loose tubes in there, and then get them hot enough that they would begin to get sticky, not so hot that they collapse, etc. cetera. Um, not hot enough, they don't stick. Uh, so you get them stuck together so they begin to perform as a single bundle rather than a bunch of loose tubes. And then we can remotely drop the sling uh, from outside uh, while the whole kiln's still buttoned up. And the whole piece is riding on a giant cable that runs through its core. Um, Originally, we had uh, another set of winches, and we were going to dial in different tensions to get different arcs that we needed, but uh, we didn't have very much leverage, and pretty much if you just let the kiln run for an extra half hour, you got a deeper curve. So that's how we did that. But um, what it allowed you to do was to build these, these huge pieces uh, that didn't use molds, so you didn't have all this thermal mass. Um, and you got these curves that had sort of a built-in tension because they showed how they were actually formed. Uh, this is the thing that, like, if you've ever read Sarah talk about his stuff, he's very insistent that because um, there's a huge amount of pressure uh, sort of forcing those plates between the rollers, that that's shown in the finished work. Uh, and I think that's something that plays out here, too, that you can see when something looks like it was dead and it just kind of slumped in the kiln, and you can see when it was really kind of fighting or getting pulled by something, um, which is the case here. Um, another thing that was really interesting to us uh, on this project was uh, the idea of these tube ends. Um, and as I showed you before with that uh, little movie with the light, uh, they're kind of like fiber optics. So you can either pump light through it, or if they're, they're, not, if they're not jacketed by an opaque material, light gets in through the side walls of the tubes runs down it and you get these sort of spectacular uh, end, end glows uh, at the end of the tubes. And we wanted to make that a component of the piece. Um, and full disclosure, we couldn't get tubes that long. So uh, one of the big problems is, is that tubing's made in these huge factories. There aren't a lot of them. They're several stories tall um, and they, they run a continuous uh, feed out the bottom. They're just sort of dripping glass constantly and it comes down and as it comes down it sets up and it goes out on a conveyor. So getting the full lengths wasn't the problem. It was that the tubes in here range from let's say 20 millimeters um, up to about 80 millimeters and if you ship those across the country or around the world and they're 20-25 feet long they're all gonna snap. They, they have no bending strength. They're tiny little sticks. And until they're actually fused together into these huge bumble, uh, bundles where they act like a big section, then they're strong. So we, we literally just couldn't figure out how to get this stuff to us. Um, so we sort of thought, oh, well, maybe we can turn, turn it into a design detail. Uh, that didn't work. Um, and we started getting all of this cracking. Well, the idea of the, the aesthetic detail worked. But as you can see, the idea of the um, structural detail failed massively. Um, and what you're seeing here is just light coming down through the tubes and glass um, is very good at showing where it's been broken if you pump enough light through it. Uh, that's actually how they test windows for the space shuttle is just the same system, edge lighting. Um, shows any flaws very quickly. Um, so what was happening is here is you, you had these two tubes coming up next to each other and all the tube joints were randomly spaced. So you'd have a tube joint halfway up its neighboring tube you get these huge stress concentrations where, where this tube stopped and the next one started because everything's getting hot and cold at different rates and they're stretching at different rates. Um, and so you get one crack and cracks want to run and they want to keep going as long as there's stress. Um, and what's happening here is they're actually jumping, starting at that stress concentrator where a tube ends next to a neighbor and then running across the pack. Um, so our solution was actually to rebuild the tubes back at the studio where we actually started joining them together and 
hear Ari's sort of forcing the tubes together under heat, fusing them, and then actually we started over-forcing them or over-joining them, so pushing more glass into that well <clears throat> and creating these sort of thickened wall sections. So they actually accentuate um, what we were trying to get before and create these little sort of apparently percolating bubbles of light that travel up the piece. Um, and those are acting just like lenses, taking ambient light and focusing them down, just like a regular magnifying glass would. Um, so that seemed to solve that problem. We have the continuous run, so there'd be no more cracking. Uh, we have these extra nice bubbles now. Um, and of course, it continued to crack, and uh, it continued to crack, and they continued to crack. Uh, despite our best efforts, uh, it's hard to convey how um, grueling this is uh, you know to weld up all the tubes for one of these stalks probably took one person a week week and a half and then actually getting them all together prepping the fire you know every time you lost one of these things thousands and thousands of dollars and you know a week or two of several people's uh, labor and you get so deep into these problems and looking at all the data uh, that sometimes very obvious solutions become obscured and especially difficult solutions remain obscured. Um, and in this case, we had forgotten something that we learned several years earlier on, uh, on our first project, which would have solved the whole problem if we had uh, been able to remember it, but we were in too deep. Um, this is the inside of the kiln box, uh, which is a crazy gaggle of wires. And they're actually, uh, it has an onboard controller that's a little fancier than most kilns. They're actually used for um, ovens in airplane food prep places. So like where they have these 300 foot conveyor ovens rolling uh, muffins through. So these kilns are able to turn on conveyor belts at certain portions and then slow them down or speed them up to cool the muffins, etc. So they have all these inputs and outputs on them. And uh, one thing that people usually don't realize, annealing for those of you who are not glass creatures, um, is really just about uh, cooling something at a very special rate, the rate being uh, slow enough that it can go through various um, stress points and phase changes so that everyone's coming down to room temperature in a nice orderly fashion, unlike the cracks we were getting before where they're not. So uh, the problem is that everyone's always monitoring the oven or the kiln, right? You go home, you put something in the oven, you dial it up to 500. You don't really care how hot the oven is. You care how hot your lamb chop is, your baked potato is. And it's the same thing for glass. You don't really care what's going on uh, outside. You care what's going on inside the actual glass piece. What's going on in the kiln is irrelevant. Um, so we realized we had all these extra pickups on the, um, on the on this kiln controller, and we started running them in, kind of like electrodes on someone's head. So we'd we'd bury one ten feet deep down the core of the of the uh, the column, one underneath it, one at either end, and then actually as the kiln ran, we could set up a program parameter where if any one of those data points got more than 20 degrees out of whack with any of the other data points, everyone froze. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't there a duck duck game where you have to do that? Everyone just stops, right? And you wait until everyone falls back in line and then the kiln goes. So it basically builds uh, automatic on the fly kiln programs based on what the, the actual glass is doing. Um, so that should give you a vague idea of some of the stuff that that we encounter in some of the projects. Um, one of the things, I don't know if you, uh, you know, you're at the doctor, you're filling out an insurance form, and they always ask you for occupation, and I, of course, never know what to put. Um, I am certainly not an engineer. I don't have a degree. Uh, as Guido said, uh, comp lit. And um, I wouldn't feel comfortable putting down artist, um, designer, kind of, but doesn't really capture it. Um, the path that I took to get where I'm at and uh, what the studio does, I did probably true for everyone who works with me, um, is certainly not the path that I assumed I would go on. Uh, I was at uh, Oberlin College, uh, losing my mind, uh, had to get out of there, liked it a great deal, but it was in the middle of nowhere, transferred to Brown, and had a semester <coughs> off and went to New York. I figured I'd find a uh, 
just a weird eccentric job. So I started going through the classifieds as one did back in the day in, I guess, 1988. Um, and I found a job ad for a stained glass assistant, which I, I called up and I said, of course, I knew what I was doing. I didn't. Um, but I figured uh, coming from a family that was involved in the arts, I could wing it. Uh, and it was an awful job. It was uh, Brooklyn was not the place it is today. Uh, this was in about a 20 minute walk from a subway station. God save us. And uh, all the buildings were abandoned and they were at the top of this four story small industrial building and the first three floors had nobody in them. And the elevator was broken. And one of my jobs was to carry the raw glass up the stairs. Um, so like these big three, four foot square sheets of plate and stained glass. Um, needless to say, I had nightmares. Um, and my bosses were terrible. One was named Ehor, I kid you not. Um, and the other one used to call me Boy, um, Boy. Could you come here? <laughs> he thought it was very funny. I, of course, did not. Um, and stained glass can be very beautiful, but it's, um, I hope no one's a big stained glass artist here. Um, it's very monotonous, um, and I, it was just drudgery. Um, so I figured there's got to be something more to this. Uh, I found that the experimental glass workshop in uh, New York, which used to be down in Little Italy, a tiny little place, it was sandwiched between Umberto's Clam House, where there was a big mob rub out, and uh, a gelato place, and it was this weird little labyrinth-like entry up this ramp, and there were two or three furnaces, and there was a guy whose name I can't remember anymore, who did all these uh, very traditional Venetian figurines by himself in the exact same way they did it in the 16th century and the 17th century, um, a real sort of talented kook. Um, and I took a couple lessons there, and then uh, I left and went off to school, got my degree in comp lit. I had extra time my last semester at Brown. I figured, eh, what the hell, I'll go take a class at RISD. I took the introductory glass one class uh, with a guy named Michael Shiner. Um, and one of the assignments was the word organic, and um, I, of course, didn't do very well. Everyone else was doing these very conceptual things, bottle of blood, bottle of urine, bottle of milk. Um, and I uh, made things that looks like swashes. Uh, I took everything very literally and got very interested in this uh, sort of language of organic stuff. And a friend of my mom, I had given some pieces to my mother, saw one of them, commissioned one, then I made it, went to New York. She refused it. I was dumbstruck. Someone doesn't do that. Uh, partly because I thought it was nice. And it was my mother's, you know, a close friend of hers. So, I decided to shop it around. I called up someplace on Madison Avenue uh, that showed a lot of design -y objects. It was owned by a Japanese company. And I went over there, showed them my stuff. Oh, I was in town delivering something for commission and thought you might be interested in seeing my work. And um, they started carrying it. Uh, and then I moved to San Francisco uh, a couple months later and uh, started working for this guy, Michael Cronin. Um, who uh, unfortunately just died very recently. Um, a very sort of formative uh, person in my life. And he, uh, he did a lot of stuff. He did a bunch of work for the post office. He also named the Kindle uh, and TiVo and did a lot of big branding. I, of course, was his lackey. Uh, I did a bunch of design work on a polo book. And um, he was always super supportive. He used to loan me money to rent time over in the East Bay to blow my stuff on the side that I was still selling. And at this point, I was starting to get it into places like Gumps and Barneys and things like that. Um, and then I had, I think I lasted about six months there, and then I had the I'm, I quit, you're fired conversation, which uh, essentially I figured that he asked me to go out to lunch and I thought he was going to can me because I didn't really know how to do graphic design. Uh, so I started saying, I felt badly, so I was like, listen, you know, maybe it's time that I moved on. He thinks that I actually quit. So uh, to this day, <laughs> no one really knows. Um, but then I started uh, working in the basement of my house in San Francisco, which was pretty much a dirt crawl space. Um, and for the next five or six years, uh, I continued to make that production work, for lack of a better word. Uh, most of the stuff was sculptural, ostensibly functional, not really. Um, and out of the blue, uh, the Gary Commission happened. 
which really was uh, not more complicated than he saw it at someone's house. Hey, who did that? Um, and then someone from his office got in touch with me. Um, and a couple of people asked me, what's it like to work with him? You know, he's a pretty um, amazing architect. Um, and the answer is he was totally hands off. Uh, I always feel badly. I don't have any uh, spectacular stories to tell you other than he had supreme confidence considering that I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and, uh, you know, when I went down there for the first presentation of the models that I'd come up with, I remember I had three. They were sort of iterative. So I started with the first. This is what I was trying to do. So I thought this would work with that and it would be relative to this. And then in this model, I sort of tried to deal with that problem and change it. And after I'd gone on for about 10 minutes, he said, da -da 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 -da. which one do you want to do? And I said, number three. And he said, okay. <laughs> um, so it was for the main atrium of the headquarters of uh, a bank, a DZ bank. And um, at that time, uh, I was 26 when I started it. This project took me all in probably about four or five years. Um, and uh, I was totally green. Uh, I hadn't made anything bigger than about my, wing, my wingspan. And um, I learned a huge amount in an incredibly quick, uh, assaultive, uh, and often extraordinary way. Um, and this project uh, pretty accurately predicts everything that I've done since then. Um, it was a really seminal uh, project. Uh, it was just inside Pariser Plots, which is where the Brandenburg Gates are, so <clears throat> has super, super strict zoning. So the exterior of the building, you couldn't really do much with, because it led out onto this historic plaza. Um, this is the divide between east and west, essentially. Um, and uh, so all the energy went to the center of the building, which was the that weird thing is the conference hall, otherwise known as the horse's head. Um, and the piece we ended up doing was pretty much just a conversation with that. You couldn't avoid it. You couldn't ignore it. It was uh, it was quite an icon. So uh, it was menacing somewhat. Uh, it was it was quite opaque. It was covered in uh, stainless, and um, the inside is quite beautiful. It's uh, all covered in this beautiful honey wood, very inviting. The outside's kind of terrifying. Uh, so we figured that our response to it had to be a very ephemeral and light, and that idea of going into a space and spending all your time trying to think of how do you respond to that is pretty much the way we start every project. Um, so there are 36 panels that fly through the space. They're about the size of cars um, and kind of rise up to meet the mouth of the conference hall. Oh, look, and there's Guido. Um, so uh, now I thought I'd tell you two stories about um, some of the kinds of problems we ran into, how we solved them. Um, and I think they're both... Um, they describe very well how absolutely adrift we were. Um, and how we worked through it um, sort of remarkably, um, doing a lot of pretty crazy things. So uh, as I said, I hadn't built anything very big before this. And you can't really blow anything bigger than yourself. So that wasn't going to be the solution to this space, um, which was quite large. And can you guys hear me OK? Um, so uh, one of the things I immediately started thinking about was you needed a lot of glass and you needed a lot of it readily available because I certainly didn't have any big furnaces and production facilities to crank out that kind of stuff. So um, plate glass, uh, very common, very dense, very heavy, very boring. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you see so much large architectural um, plate glass sculpture. It's readily available um, and it's very well tested and people have trouble finding stuff that they can get their paws on uh, that's very quantifiable. Um, so I got interested in tubing, which is also very readily available, mostly for laboratories. And they also reprocess it a lot for a lot of the jars that you buy your pickles in and things like that. Um, and when you create these fused bundles with it, um, they're essentially hollow honeycombs, cellular structures. So they're very light. Um, so. I made the first panel in my little kiln that was probably not much bigger than this table. Um, 
And I was pointed towards a young guy at Arup, which is an engineer, a big engineering firm, and, uh, and he was in their London office, and he was in San Francisco for uh, a big glass conference. And he grabbed this other guy, Michael Mulhern, who uh, does glass connection systems. He did a lot of the stuff, like all the little doodads on Pays, uh, pyramids at the Louvre, all the connections on the outside of the glass box of uh, Polshek's uh, piece around the planetarium, the big sphere in New York. Um, I think what happened was uh, Graham was like, I gotta go meet this guy. He doesn't sound like he knows what he's doing. Could you come with me? I need backup. So I met them in the hotel lobby. And um, the day before, I had broken the sample. And it was the only sample I had, and it was maybe this big. And um, I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't do anything about it. So uh, I turned up this meeting very sheepish. Um, because, as I said, I, I didn't really know how I was going to do any of this, and these guys were engineers. And uh, to add insult to injury, I was like, here's my piece of glass um, that had these big cracks and missing pieces of glass. And uh, to make a long story short, it turned out that those cracks were sort of the solution, the saving grace to that whole project, because none of the glass in there is tempered. Um, and uh, none of it is laminated, which are two common forms of safety glass used in public spaces. The idea is that, uh, in one case, laminated glass, you hit it, it breaks, it slumps, it's held together by this interlayer of glue so that you can deal with the situation, take it out of the store window frame, what have you. Uh, tempered glass in your heart, in your car, uh, explodes, and the idea is you set up a stress pattern in the glass such that it explodes into such small pieces that no one really gets hurt by it. Um, this stuff was kind of an end run on both of those things and effectively um, a very specialized new kind of safety glass where because um, it was that cellular structure, it had all these individual compartments and it tended to localize, um, quarantine if you will, cracks. And so they didn't spread and so you had time to actually deal with it. Um, and when we were uh, pitching that project to the, we had to go through the German authorities and we spent about uh, a week making a special video where we would get like nine or ten meters up and drop various things on glass panels to show them that it would effectively catch them. And we'd drop lights on them, drop wrenches on them, um, and uh, they caught them, kind of like mitts. Um, so th th that's something that sort of was, as you can tell, a big mistake. Uh, I hadn't intended to break the panel, but it yielded this sort of remarkable result and we've sort of used a lot of those cellular structures in many of the work since then. Um, the other thing was that uh, on that project we also started getting some very complicated sort of internal glass um, uh, questions in terms of annealing uh, and the structure of the assemblies that we were making and we figured that the only people who could probably help us were people at Corning since they had done so much um, in those fields. And so we just started calling Corning and working our way through their phone tree until we found this guy who was a specialist in annealing um, named Hank Hagee, who had done all the annealing schedules for the Palomar telescope lenses, these huge, huge lenses um, that are still around today. Um, and the other guy was this guy, uh, Herb Miska, who had worked on uh, as I mentioned before, the windows for the space shuttle. Um, and he was actually, they were both retired guys. They were probably 75, 80. Herb was building a canoe in his garage. And we'd start having these conversations with them. And we were amazed because Palomar telescope lens, you know, space shuttle, I mean, that's pretty incredible. Uh, and they were really interested in talking to us because now they were retired. And um, they were just stunned at how quickly we would try stuff. You know, they're used to working with government agencies, and it would take years to build anything or get anything done, and we'd be on the phone with them one day. They'd say, well, can't you try this? And we're like, we'll call you tomorrow. And we'd go do the test, and so it was very sort of down and dirty. So there was this very sort of simpatico back and forth relationship between these old guys from Corning and us. Um, so there was this guy, Hank, I used to call Captain. I don't know why I started doing that. So we'd get on the phone, and I'd go like, uh, you know, Captain Hagee, how are you? And he'd go like, fine. Rah, rah, rah. And we had built this kiln, a different kiln that we had built just for uh, a project. And as you can see there, uh, through the door, it was all top fired, meaning all the elements were on the roof. Basically, uh, much like your oven, um, 
and the broiler part of your oven. And that's why Hank one day said that all the annealing problems we were having were uh, the consequence of us having a dang broiler, um, which we were very offended by. Um, and so we started talking about convection and how to solve that. And so we, we ultimately uh, decided to get these big stainless steel propellers and um, try and mix up the air, kind of like how you now have little fans in your convection toaster oven and stuff like that to blow the air around. Um, we built this assembly on the backside with motors, and we mounted it. And you know, the, the you can see on the front there, there they just these tiny little windows that are about six inches. They're quartz windows, which have a higher melting temperature than most of the stuff we were working at. So you could still see through them, and they wouldn't start slumping when we started slumping our glass. Um, but you couldn't really tell what was going on. And so we convinced Chris, uh, who worked with us, uh, to put on a big respirator and climb in the kiln. And we'd turn on the propellers. And then we lit smoke bombs. And um, he was sitting in there kind of, you know, <laughs> watching the smoke swirl around him as we would adjust the propellers slightly to see if you could kind of get a good mix going where you would create an even sort of temperature throughout the kiln. Um, and when we finally did try um, to fire a panel with our new little convection adjustment, uh, we came in the next morning, we turned it on, turned on the propellers, uh, closed it up, and left. Uh, we came in the next morning, we couldn't see in any of the windows. Um, and I was standing there, it was like 6 in the morning, I came in early because I was really anxious. And I was looking through the window and I was thinking to myself, why would it be, let's say it would be colder inside so water would form, wait, no, that doesn't work because when you're like your car, it's on the outside. And I was staring at it trying to figure out how there could possibly be condensation inside of a kiln, which is usually hot. And then it finally occurred to me and I opened the door to the kiln and the whole thing was covered in about three inches of snow. The whole panel, the floor of the, the kiln looked like it was pure powder. Uh, it, it was quite, quite beautiful. And what had happened was the propellers, had, the way we had fixed them, no one thought about this, um, the propellers had gotten warm, then hot, and they had expanded. And then as they spun, the propellers started crawling up the shafts and over the course of an hour sort of made it all the way to the back wall of the kiln where there was a nice, you know, six or seven inches of fluffy refractory material and just beat it all to shreds and dispersed it like a snowstorm on the whole inside of the kiln. Needless to say, we didn't use the propeller um, solution anymore. But um, it's a good example of some of the crazy stuff we get involved in. Some of them are crazy failures, but um, they're all pretty um, critical to most of our process. Uh, the people who work with me. Um, this is a model that I made out of my favorite uh, Jap uh, sorry, uh, German crepe paper, because um, it kind of, you can get it to stretch much like glass when it's hot. Um, so I found it to be a great modeling material, but then of course you start making shapes that look good with that particular paper. And so you end up with things that are kind of an expression more of the materiality of the paper than what you're planning on building. And I found that to be a very good exercise for getting you out of your comfort zone. So a lot of times we'll end up trying to figure out how you make a sculpture that looks like paper and glass. Um, and it's also another way of saying that uh, I really don't believe that you should design based on what's in your toolbox. Um, you should design based on what you want to do and then figure out how to do it. And I, I think that's an expression of the fact probably that uh, I didn't have any formal training. No one told me how I was supposed to hold the jacks or carry the pipe or uh, those are blowing things. Uh, I never learned what the right way was. Um, so there was never this anxiety about doing it wrong. Um, and I'd say that usually at, by the time we finish any one project, I'd say about 70 or 80 percent of the way through, we finally figure out how you're actually supposed to do it. And uh, probably about the first 50 or 60 percent of it is spent breaking stuff, failures, changing direction, redoing the whole design. Uh, pretty radically, I'm not saying this lightly, like it's not uncommon that 
halfway through the project will just completely change everything about how we're approaching the problem. The material, the size of the tubes, whether it's fired vertical or horizontal, it just kind of throw a lot up in the air. And by the time the projects are over, we're usually pretty bored with it. Um, that you kind of see all the mistakes, usually because it's taken like a year, so you grow and you're like, oh, that's not that interesting anymore, let's do it this way. And so by the time you get to the end of it, you're always thinking about the next way you would do it. And so uh, a lot of what we do at the shop is build uh, things that we don't have that we need. Um, on the left is a, a, a weaving machine that allows us to put um, sort of anywhere from four to 10 to 12 uh, sort of weave laces on um, these sort of uh, woven tube assemblies. Um, the middle one is for feeding cables through said uh, umpteen number of tubes. The one on the end is a little fire polisher, but um, essentially to do this kind of stuff, it doesn't really matter whether the people know anything about glass. I'm, I'm really not interested in people um, who have those degrees, or any degree for that matter. Um, it's more important to find people who like solving problems. Uh, it's usually uh, more about how someone thinks about a problem uh, that's important to me. You want the people who want to take apart the clock when it breaks and fix it. Um, so uh, I thought I would I guess, suffice it to say that uh, we actually have two people who studied uh, and got their degrees in art history. Um, and we actually have one guy who worked in a tuna packing canning plant and also pretty much every other job known to man. Um, but I was just going to tell you about three people in particular. Uh, Arlen uh, got his degree in food science up at Davis. Um, he also uh, participated, this was actually part of his uh, application to the studio, his resume was uh, a club that held competitions for uh, who could build uh, the plane that was able to carry the most uh, weight only using a particular size engine, particular wingspan, etc. and you make your version of the plane and they have these contests. Uh, this was one of the things that Arlen did and uh, he actually was on his way to um, go work at the laboratory for Sierra Nevada in their uh, brewery laboratory, I guess quality assurance and we, we poached him thankfully. Um, and uh, Sam uh, was trained as an engineer and is uh, obsessed with Lego and actually over the years versions of tools we have have slowly started appearing in the shop where he'll come in one day and he's like oh look I made the boom lift from Shanghai and um, <laughs> on the right is uh, our chop saw and uh, when he got sick uh, over a couple of days, he built this from memory. So I'm here with Sam, who made a Lego model of this big kiln in the shop. So Sam, why don't you give us a quick rundown of what we're seeing? First, you're going to see the vents open on top, and the door opens with a set of counterweights, and the bed slides out from the oven. Super, and then there are all these little pins. What are those doing? The pins are used to impart a shape into the glass that we're forming. There's a set of gears and chains underneath which raise a platen. The platen picks up each pin and raises it to a specific height so that you can set any any shape that you're looking for and impart it into the glass. Yeah, which is cool, right? Because you don't have all the thermal mass and you don't have these really big expensive molds. Excellent. I'm glad you spent your time doing this when you were sick. <laughs> um. The last person I was going to introduce to you was uh, Dave, who unfortunately just left us. He's uh, long been a huge fan of the Exploratorium. He's now in charge of their outdoor arts program. Um, he uh, was trained also as an engineer. Um, he also was a programmer at Apple for a while. Uh, he also worked at ILM doing robotics and puppetry and has the claim of fame as having been the puppeteer for the alien that pops out of the belly in Spaceballs. Um, and for his father-in-law's 75th birthday, he built this from scratch, he designed all the gears, uh, cut them himself, and assembled them, uh, assembled them, and a bunch of the mechanisms in here are exactly 75 millimeters to celebrate his 75th birthday. So as you can see, uh, 
basically a lot of the people who work for me uh, are gearheads. Uh, they like tinkering. And because we create a lot of problems, that's a very uh, important kind of person to have around. Um, needless to say, I couldn't do uh, any of what I do without them. And one of the more interesting things that I've found over the years is that the work skews to whoever is working for me. So when we had a lot of mechanical guys, machining guys, the work started getting uh, about connections um, and very physical relations. And then over the last, there was a two, two and a half year period where we had three people in the shop who were, I, I don't know, enough about coding to really say this with any great sense of assurance, but they were like solid mid-level Cody kind of people. So all the solutions started to be driven by these very intensive CAD solutions where it wasn't just using CAD, it was sort of piggybacking programming languages on top of them to automate a lot of solutions to logistical problems. So the, the solution, the, the artwork was allowed to sort of gain all of these uh, logistical, statistical elements that never would have been possible if we didn't have those kinds of people. So who works for you is really, really important. Um, in this fourth section, I just wanted to sort of talk you through one idea across a bunch of different projects so you can kind of see how I look at it to an extent. You know, after Berlin, we had made those simple curved panels. Um, and we started getting really interested in double curved, double curved surfaces where um, we might fire two, three, four times. And we would literally sort of be remotely reaching in uh, with a whole bunch of cable systems and pulleys and weights and sort of peeling parts of the glass up and over, kind of like um, marionettes, uh, where we would be remotely kind of controlling the panel because we couldn't put our hands in. We would do it sort of via these cable systems. And um, one of the frustrations with a lot of the fused work um, was that once you installed it, you couldn't change it. You couldn't tweak it. You couldn't adjust it. Once it left the kiln, that was it. So uh, in, a, in a piece like this, which was done for a Norman Foster residence, um, he didn't live there, he designed it. Um, the pieces nest really closely. And so to get the four good pieces that you see here, we probably made about 10 or 12 and scrapped six or eight of them. Um, so even when we'd model them very carefully and digitize them and then program the kiln and set up all these kinds of standards to check against, when you close the door, they would invariably start doing their own thing. And you had the choice of either stopping it or letting it go. And of course, you let it go because that's when you always get the nicest stuff. Sometimes it would run away from you or sometimes you get stuff that you wouldn't imagine. So you couldn't sort of ensure that you'd get these pieces that would actually work. So it was kind of a crapshoot. Um, and as we started getting commissions that were bigger and bigger, this was not a very uh, reliable way to work uh, or way to sort of base a business by any means. And uh, for, the, for this other project that we started working on for Capella, which was also a foster building in Singapore, um, I was just noodling in the, uh, the glass shop. Um, this is probably about an inch and a half. Um, just kind of making stuff, flailing. Uh, trying to come up with some kind of inspirational idea. And I made this little thing, and after, you know, sat on my desk for a while, and I started looking at it, and I kind of started to appreciate that it had these sort of accordion-like qualities, right? It had this pleating, this venting that went up and down, back and forth. And we started to think about that as a way of building sculptures, that you'd sort of create these modular systems where you'd have hundreds and hundreds of tubes, and they'd be sewn together into these uh, sort of fabrics, if you will, right? If you think about an accordion, all the vents in it um, are actually stiff. The leather doesn't bend. It's the way they're all related to their neighbor that allows you to get these incredibly complex organic forms. So when I started looking at it, I started thinking of all those crazy shapes you could make with these stiff pieces of leather. And according to I thought, oh, well, glass is stiff at room temperature. You could do that. And then maybe you could actually build something where you could change its shape at room temperature and you could basically sculpt uh, without heat. Um, so uh, we started to build these, uh, this is sort of the tail end of the process, but started building these armatures uh, based on uh, scale models and then sewing these uh, sort of panels of glass into these accordion-like structures that were then shipped uh, 
over to Singapore, actually suspended on like giant rubber bands inside of these space frame crates. Um, and then once on site, they were prepped and uh, lifted into space one by one, largely formed. And uh, here you're seeing a whole bunch of feeder motors that could be controlled individually, so we kind of drive them all in unison, get them up there, and then we could start actuating motors differentially to adjust the attitude and kind of get it roughly uh, how we wanted. And then we could go up there and you could actually change the shape, kind of like hauling a sail uh, in or letting it out as you could, as, as it were. And if you go up there, you can, you can literally push on the piece and it'll, it'll kind of give a little bit. Uh, you can push a depression into it. Um, so this was this was a big deal, right? Because you could be on site and you could be looking at it, going, mm, right? Um, which I know all the architects in the room have wanted to do countless times with various walls. Um, but then we started thinking, like, well, what would happen if you unfurled it? What if you started to actually treat treat it just like raw material, um, just as sort of sections that would get strung together into these long lengths? Um, and then sort of uh, sculpt it on site so you could start imagining sculptures that were enormous that could get pieced together inside the room and sculpt it on site, something you could never ship because of course it would be far too large. So the idea, the whole sculpture that I'm going to show you shipped in two boxes that were about six meters, so 20 feet long, maybe three feet, two, two three feet wide, two, three feet tall, tiny. Um, and then they'd get taken out and they'd get articulated uh, into their vague accordion kind of shape um, based on a bunch of CAD that we had done. That model I just showed you before was kind of the Bible for everything. And then they would get lifted on site in these same six meter sections. And they're basically like giant wet noodles. You can see how flexible the stuff was. So even though. I kind of wanted it to be flexible. Yeah, I'd never that? anticipated that it would be this flexible. It was almost unruly. Some of these lifts were really hard to control because the stuff would just be noodling all over the place. Um, and the only thing that's holding it in place is about five or six hundred um, very small, small cables. Um, and based on their exact connection to points on the ceiling, to exact points on the piece, very particular lengths, those describe the general shapes that you're seeing, and then you can kind of stand back and go a little up, a little down, a little this way, that way, and you can kind of, uh, you, you can tweak it on site and kind of finesse these curves. This was done with about eight or nine people, um, occasionally ten over the course of about three weeks. Um, and this is, a, this is a real game changer um, because what you start to realize is that uh, scale goes out the window, um, that you could make something, in this case, you know, a city block and a half, two city blocks long. You could make it five blocks long. You could make it two stories high, five stories high. You get the idea. Because it's a modular system, you can go any which way, which is really important if you're building stuff that's supposed to talk to building. Um, the other thing is that the idea that your limitation on building something only as big as a car or a tree also goes out the window because they're not stiff elements. They're flexible, so they can withstand um, pressures and changes and adjust, essentially. They've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of joints, uh, unlike those giant glass trees. Um, you probably couldn't get them much past about six meters, uh, so unless you started making them a lot fatter, but that's a scary proposition. Um, so uh, then we started to miss all the sensuality that we'd gotten when we were actually working the glass hot, right? So we had started with the, the simple forms, then we'd done the double curved forms, then we got frustrated with the fact that they were kiln formed. So we made this fabric and we lifted it on space, but it wasn't really fabric, so we made it act like fabric and then we started sculpting it on site. But they were all straight tubes, so they didn't have that certain je ne sais quoi um, that you get from glass that uh, is actually bent. So we started to put the fabric back in the kiln. And by very carefully uh, putting a couple of parameters on which parts could fall in or fall out, you can then close up the kiln and it was kind of like its own controlled little ecosystem. And you kind of let gravity play out based on where you were holding it and restraining it. Um, and you'd get these incredibly sort of sensual forms that were still flexible, 
So um, in this case, they were potted into a track with this uh, electrical silicone. So you could go up to them and hit them, and they were kind of like jello. They go, bah, 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 bah. Um, which means that uh, once they get on site, you can nest them incredibly closely. So if there are any variances between the pieces, whereas before in that first piece that I showed you, you know, if this part went out four inches too far and you tried to put them together the way you designed, they wouldn't fit. Whereas in this one, they just kind of, they, they, they gave. So you can get these really, really complex nested form. And by the way, all the color that you're seeing in the room there is just the surrounding jungle and um, pool. They're, they're kind of like chameleons, so they just throw back whatever colors around them. And that's the way they kind of integrate into the spaces that they're in. Um, the tracks that you saw them formed in are actually behind that system. It's a sort of system of leather tiles that we made that echoes the construction of the surrounding ceiling that's made of these kind of domino-shaped uh, mirrored bronze tiles. So it's a way that it's sort of supposed to integrate into the space. Um, most recently, um, I've become obsessed with this image uh, from an Isemiyaki ad. Uh, for those of you who know his clothes, um, he loves the accordion, the pleat. Um, and uh, this thing just kind of looked like a lot of stuff that I always wanted to make. Uh, I spent a lot of time thinking I was going to be an oceanographer when I was in high school, and I, I worked at Scripps, and this looks like crazy nudibranchs. Um, or anemone-like things to me. Um, and so we've been sort of trying to then go one step back and say, well, if you take the fabric, you get it hot, and you actually put curves into it, and you start getting these, you know, you can make these very, very complex shapes. Um, what happens if you start treating that again like fabric that you can sculpt on the fly? Those pieces that I just showed you in that last project, we took fabric, put it in the kiln, got it hot, and then whatever came out was fixed, and you could kind of nestle them, but that was it. Um, with this stuff, uh, we're starting to play around with the idea that you could kind of do the Shanghai-like project again where you could go back into a space and just sculpt on site, but instead of having all these straight-tubed uh, fabrics, you can have these much, much more complex central shapes. So everything you're seeing here is made of tubes that all have the exact same radius. So that means that they're all identical, which just seems impossible, right? Those are all the same tubes. So you get back to the ability to have a kit of parts where you can go on site, a tube breaks, just swap it out. It's a system. It's, uh, it's Lego. Um, and so you can see, you can start getting some, some, some really, really complex forms that basically look blown, right? You get all that stretchiness and drooping, and it's really starting to look like fabric again. Um, so the last uh, thing I was going to talk to you about was uh, this idea of talking to buildings. Uh, you know, the first stuff that I made was essentially gallery work uh, unto itself. Uh, Self-reflexive wasn't really about anything around it. Um, not very interesting to me. Um, and then the work that we started to do was all about the space that it was in uh, after the Gary building. So uh, for this project that I showed you earlier, um, it was actually in this Foster Hotel, and in the middle of the courtyard, there was an oculus. And this was a ballroom that was actually underneath it. And because all the natural light was coming in from above, you walked in, the first thing you did was look up, because that's where all the light was. <clears throat> so we decided that, obviously, that's where the glass should go, because glass likes light. And the whole space was built of circles, the oculus, uh, the dome, circular room, the outside uh, corridor was circular. So the whole piece became about circles. And when we started scaling up the piece to be big enough to fit in the room and look right, you blocked the whole skylight. And so we eventually cut out the center kind of like a donut. It's kind of like a swirling vortex. So when you walk in, you can still look up and see the sky. But it's still it's sort of quite massive in, in sort of elevation, despite the fact that it's got a hollow middle. Um, so the point here is, if you took this piece out of the room, it really wouldn't make very much sense. It's so integrated. Uh, and influenced by where it is, that it really wouldn't work anywhere else. Um, this is the one project that I'm going to show you that's actually in this country, uh, in our city. Um, it's called Bar Agricole, and it's built in an old <coughs> warehouse space that was originally a brewery uh, that has these three big old skylights in it. And the architect put in this dropped ceiling so that the place wasn't so tall, because it was a very long sort of shotgun space. And then, uh, we proposed these glass sort of boxes that essentially extrude the skylights down through 
the space. And we worked really closely with the architects to sort of make these cutouts. So there's a very, very close relationship between the architecture and the sculpture. And hopefully, you know, you walk into the place and you're not sure whether the architect did those things or whether the sculptor did part of the ceiling or... Um, this is probably most reflective of where we kind of want to be. Um, that blurred line between being uh, a sculptor and an architect. Uh, this is just an image. Uh, this is just natural light coming down through the piece. Um, in terms of where we're kind of heading, uh, this was a project that we started working on that was actually, uh, most of it was underground. So those three or four stories you see there, uh, sorry, the three stories below, the fourth is above ground, um, didn't get any natural light. Uh, and there was a huge space over here. Um, so we started working on this idea of using heliostats, which are quite old uh, systems of technology where uh, you're essentially bouncing sunlight in very particular directions. Um, so today, you now just have mirrors on motor drives that track the sun as it moves through the sky and it's always heading it into a particular space or in this case to a mirror that shoots it down through that stairwell. Um, and we started imagining uh, a sculptural kind of light piece that, that sort of performed a function uh, that actually uh, diffused the light, became a, an aesthetic central focus to the space but was actually doing some work. Uh, you can start to imagine how it would be rendered based on some of the fabrics I showed you just before. Um, and inside of the column, there would be these, it would be wrapped in this uh, lenticular plastic, so the light coming down would get redirected out and kind of wash through that thing, and you'd get light through the whole stairway all the way down uh, three or four stories underground. Um, that's the end of everything I was going to show you. Uh, I guess the last thing that I was going to say was... Uh, I've been doing this for, I guess, about 14 years, at least kind of what you're seeing on the screen right now. And all of it's been tubing. And every once in a while, I get someone going, so, you do anything besides tubes? Um, and the answer is currently no. Um, we seem to remain uh, challenged by it, despite the fact that we've been using them for so long. Um, None of the projects are really identical. They're all kind of different in some pretty fundamental way. And if it's not obviously aesthetic, then it's, I can assure you it's definitely technical. Uh, it's kind of like holding a geode and, you know, we usually get tired of it this way, but you can kind of look at it like that or like that. And presumably when we run out of different angles to look at the stuff, we'll get rid of it. Um, I have a sneaking suspicion that's hopefully going to be in the next year or two. Um, but... Uh, I still find it incredibly interesting, and I think probably most of what I find interesting is the challenges I was talking about. Um, so thank you, and if anyone has any questions. Nine? Um, I assume you mean sort of politically. Talk about dropping objects on. Well, so for example, in um, in the agricole project, there are two or three redundant systems in the glass. So one of the main ones is. Um, you, you basically want to, if it, each of those boxes, as you extrude them down, have four sides. And so you basically want to stop each of the walls from getting going. Um, and you can't see them. They're very delicate cable networks that come down, uh, if the box is here, that come down on an angle to sort of roughly a little below midpoint on the, on the panel, right? So this guy stops him from swinging this way. And then there's a, a grid that passes along the inside of the piece and then goes back up again. So you've basically got this. So on both sides of each of those wall panels, they can't do this. So that, that's one system that stops them from getting going. Um, 
And every one of those connections to the ceiling has little uh, dampening elements in it uh, where the cable actually attaches. Uh, then there are four horizontal weaves up each panel. So even if one fails, there are three redundant ones above it. And then inside of every single tube that's hanging there, there are two totally separate cables uh, that are continuously tied back up to the ceiling. So the idea is that if any pieces break, they're basically like beads on a necklace. You might get a couple little chips, but um, all of the larger elements are held in place by those uh, cables running through the cores. Um, there's some other solutions to, you know, every project's kind of different. Uh, the first project that I showed you, uh, or that was on the screen, this guy was actually uh, in Tokyo. And um, as you can imagine, they're surprisingly, understandably concerned about it. And uh, there's about a 50-page report, uh, seismic modeling that we did with Arup on in different conditions, exactly which areas of the glass are stressed and how highly they're stressed. Um, and the piece unto itself is uh, seismically pretty safe, but this particular client, um, it's a very, very big, prominent Japanese developer. This is kind of their, uh, their baby, their new headquarters, and everything about the building is uh, maxed out. And they insisted on putting this new patented seismic ceiling that they've developed above the sculpture. So the whole rest of the building might be doing this, but apparently the ceiling immediately above our sculpture is just going to be floating there. Uh, <coughs> but it's pretty interesting. The outside skin of the building has a whole series of giant hydraulic pistons. They're actually somewhat uh, visible, apparently, in the Tokyo market. It's almost a selling point where the seismic um, systems become aesthetic and uh, a marketing kind of element. But all, all the stuff that we've done, you know, that video we made for Berlin, for the code people, no one would ever look at it. Because the, you know, the fixtures code guy was like, that's not a fixture, that's, uh, you know, architecture. And the, arch the architecture structural guy would be like, that's not architectural structure, that's like either a fixture or it's an art thing. And, you know, hot potato. Um, so most of the projects that we do uh, were essentially policing ourselves in concert with Arab. So these, uh, some of these works are amazingly technically challenging, and you throw a lot of technology at it, but at the same time you have to rely on the kneeling knowledge of a guy who's 75 years old from the Corning Museum. How does that work? How do you deal with that uncertainty? Um, Science for tubing? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know how to say this. Uh, by the way, the, the guy who's 75 is like supremely, he's actually, uh, he's, he died a couple of years ago. But um, if you're really into like annealing sciences, he's a, he's a I mean, major domo, kingpin. Uh, so he, he's very well um, established and respected. But you know, honestly, um, at the end of the day, yeah, it's us alone in the studio. <clears throat> and most of the time, <clears throat> we know more about this glass than even guys at Corning or Arup. So in a lot of these projects, everyone's getting in each other's sandboxes because um, there are no standards for the stuff we're building. So in a lot of architectural conditions, right, you look up uh, beam strengths for various 2x4s and 6x8s and all the rest of it. When you start putting glass together like this, every single assembly acts differently. And then when you treat it as a sculptural material where not everyone is identical and the quality control is, is, is largely aesthetic, um, you get all kinds of variability that even if you could engineer it, you know, it might change because I decided to make it go a little that way as opposed to that way. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, we often do, a, we're sort of like, getting the engineers up to speed on how this stuff actually acts. Um, so we're doing a lot of testing in-house. So we have lots of, we have some pretty fun videos of just, we just break stuff over and over and over again. Uh, it's, it's really pretty much just like, I, I, I would imagine a standard lab 
you know, control points, data, do it again, take your lowest um, uh, answer, and that's your greatest strength, um, and build significant safety margins into it. But uh, I think the real question you were asking is, um, how do you uh, how do you keep doing it when you don't know it's going to work? Was that kind of? Yeah, you can't. You have to. Yeah, or you have to get comfortable with it. Reliability and shipping this stuff around the world. I mean, we do have insurance carriers. Um, which, which honestly is a little bit almost more for our clients than it is for us. Um, there are very few standards for, the quick, easy, direct answer to your question is, it's a total nightmare. Um, and we fall through every single crack that's established because right now we carry all the insurance that an architect does and all the insurance that a contractor does. And normally in the insurance world, their liability circles are either totally separate or one negates the other. So, you know, like if you're carrying an E&O policy and they find out that you've also got an installation policy, they're like, oh, well, that voids clause three, four of six, seven. Because normally you don't get the people who are designing this stuff also actually going on site and installing it. So the way we work is we do everything from pretty much soup to nuts. So from concept through engineering. A lot of times we're doing some of the engineering, our engineers are doing some of it, and we're actually building it. We're usually the ones packing it. We're always the ones packing it because, I mean, who would you ask to pack? Uh, and then we're the ones who fly over and install it. So in terms of liability scenarios, we're just, we're like swerving all over the road, like getting in everyone's, we're, we're, we're not where we're supposed to be. <clears throat> and we're, we're in the process of trying to, you know, reconsider that whole question yet again, but we're, um, we don't fit into any niche very well, and it causes a lot of problems. I, I'm interested in, in your switching from a gallery object to this tremendous, ambitious scale. What, what was the process of that like, sort of internally? Um, exhilarating and terrifying. Um, you know, I mean, uh, you're bluffing, you know, 90% of the time. I mean, I'd say that, so, it, I mean, that was the reason why I partly entitled that an imposter, you know, because there was, there was nothing in my experience to suggest that I could handle project budgets that big, schedules, liability, engineering. You know, and you're in there, <clears throat> there are plenty of stories on Berlin where, you know, I had friends helping me. I was so deep behind the line. Uh, we lost so much money on that and uh, so much sleep and, like, everything. Uh, I mean, I would do it all over again, but uh, I had friends coming in on the weekends, like, helping load kilns and unload kilns. It was like a sort of became a bit of a family affair. And uh, when when all these panels were breaking and breaking and breaking, you couldn't figure out how the kiln, the convection, the propellers, and all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I'd often be there at like one o'clock in the morning babysitting the kiln, convinced that it was gonna break again or we, the solution wouldn't work. And uh, yeah, there you have it. I mean, there's, there's nothing I can say that, um, that explains why I was able to stick with it. Um, and that, it, that it, it was a huge jump in scale, and um, there was no there was no legitimate process for kind of like how am I supposed to deal with this? Like, who do you ask? I mean, I used to the guy who was my liaison at Gary's office was great, but I mean, he doesn't know what the hell I'm doing most of the time. He can't help me figure out the problem with glass. Like, what do you do when this happens? Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but I mean there. There was no precedent for me personally. There was no reason why I should have thought I should I could do that. Are there any architects internationally and locally that you're dying to work with? And second question, 
Is there a reason that most of your projects are suspended? And are, would you be interested in doing ground-based ones like Richard Serra or Sale? Um, uh, yeah, I'd be more interested in doing that. Uh, I mean, the, the, the tree project's planted. Uh, it sort of has problems. I mean, the ones that get down into people's space, you've got to work a lot uh, more closely with the architects because there has to be a very um, aligned dance where, you know, the pieces are protected or positioned in such a way that it doesn't look like you're putting a glass barrier in front of them. Uh, because that kills it. I mean, in the glass tree piece, there was, you know, there was there was a, a pit there, but you couldn't see it, and there was no rail on the pit, but you'd never step into it because immediately you saw a pit. So there wasn't this like psychological moment where you're like, I can't go there, because there's a barrier. You just don't in a way. And so for a lot of the pieces that come down into people space, I think it's really important that there's a a really tight integration with the architecture so that it doesn't look. Uh, like an artificial condition that's that's protecting the piece um, and that's hard to find most architects um, or a lot of architects forgive me would probably want to do everything themselves um, and secondly the way most uh, design systems work is they're very sequential so the kind of work we do that's largely considered part of finish or interiors never gets thought of until like everything else is already drawn in, set up, so there's very little opportunity for people to interact. It's a little less that way in Japan, but uh, certainly in the United States it's it's terrible. Uh, there's not a lot of holistic design where people are talking about interiors along with architecture, along with engineering, along with construction, all up front. Um, and uh, in terms of architects, uh, I don't. I don't know if I'd say one in particular. Um, I, I. I would like. I mean. I. Th I think that. Uh, I guess the simple answer is I, I'd really like to do a lot more work in Japan. <laughs> um, I, I've been. They're a nightmare in the beginning, but once you kind of figure it out, it's. They're just incredible. I think that and money. Um, there's a lot more money in the East these days. Um, uh, um, and uh, that was Far East. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, we, I ended up going to Singapore in like 2000 and for a very small commission. And while I was over there, I just, I went around and I met a bunch of architects because I figured as long as I'm all the way over here, I met as well. And nothing happened for about two years. And then about two years later, they all started to hit um, when that whole Asian economy really started to take off. And Singapore is sort of with Hong Kong is kind of those are the twin engines for design in that whole part of the world. So we started getting more work there. And then you know, work begets work begets work. Your people see it or you're always flying over there, so you figure as long as you're in Singapore, you might as well go to Shanghai and Tokyo and it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, I also, you know, I think that sort of on a philosophical level uh, a lot of Asia's um, a lot of Asian culture and religion is much more simpatico with the whole theme of nature as much as at the same time they're destroying large parts of it you know there's uh, there is an inter there there is an interest um, uh, that I don't think really exists or in, in the United States the interest in nature is a, has a very different kind of very male um, kind of feeling to it, right? The wild world. Asia is a lot more, um, I, th I think, in keeping with some of the aesthetics that I'm interested in. Now, 
Um, <coughs> The short answer is yes, we're getting a lot better at it, and the only reason why we're getting better at it is that we've done more of it. So we're very, we're pretty good at tracking um, all of our labor pretty closely, and we've been doing it for quite a long time. So every project that we produce is another data point. So the best way to say it is, to the extent that all the projects are experimental and necessarily have this component that's unknowable, which kind of has something to do with what you were talking about. Um, the only way of being able to be predictive about it is to get a big enough backlog of unpredictable projects. Does that make sense? So they actually start to play out where over like six or seven projects, you can sort of say like installation is always 20 to 25% of the project. If it's this kind of a project where there's a lot of hot forming, hot forming involved, it skews to 30. But um, that's largely how we do it now. It's 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 a totally internal system. It, uh, there's no logic beyond that. Um, Just out of curiosity, have you ever crossed paths with Dale Chihuly? Um, no, I mean I've I've worked on a couple of projects that um, he bid on or was involved in, or um, he was actually the other for the Berlin project. There are two people I occasionally run into, um, and I don't know either of them personally, so I don't mean to suggest that I do. Um, one is Chihuly on one or two projects. We were sort of, they were the other person uh, who was up for bid or trying to get the project. And uh, Jamie Carpenter, uh, who's, uh, and both of them are, I kind of feel like I'm caught between them. Uh, you know, Jamie Carpenter, I don't know if you guys know him. They, they, both of those guys went through the RISD program in the 60s <coughs> and started Pill Chuck um, together. Um, but Jamie Carpenter is sort of more of almost like an architect slash engineer, so all of his installations are very, very, um, they're tight and they're mechanical and they're precise. Uh, he did those little dichroic fins on either side of those boat shapes at the top of the terminal in San Francisco. Um, and uh, so he's almost more techy. So he's not really competition or someone that I would think as doing the same. He does something totally different than I do. Um, so we don't cross paths that often because I think it's a very different aesthetic. And Chihuly is kind of like the totally opposite perspective. His work is almost not about wherever it is. It's about itself and color and um, so the kind of clients or projects that we're after are really a lot more about like integrating and being uh, forgive me contextual so um, but those are the only two I kind of run into okay super thanks